of the impact on the virus on your business is linearly traceable to the quality of your culture. What's shaking? Welcome back to All In. Hey, I'm Rick Jordan. I'm here today with a friend of mine, Trey Taylor. What's up, Trey? Rick, good to see you, buddy. Good to see you this week, and uh, good to see you last week, too. My man, you, you're, uh, yes, yeah, I feel you. Your book's out, and it's a CEO does only three things. Dude, first off, what are those three things? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we frame this pretty narrowly, right? Uh, and, and, and some people want to push back on it, and I'll tell you why in a second. But a CEO effectively only does three things. Those three things are culture, people, and numbers, right? But you're a CEO, I'm a CEO. The pushback is, yeah, I wish I only did three things, but in reality, I do a thousand things. What are you talking about that I only do those things? Well, it really should be you only should do those three things because you're the only person in the organization that can do those three things. And other people can do pieces of them. They can do delegated pieces of them and that sort of thing. But you're the one that has to own the ultimate responsibility as the CEO for those three things. That's fantastic because you're dead on. And one of the struggles I see a lot of CEOs is you do because you're saying that a CEO should, you know, the book is a CEO only does three things, right? I yeah. almost would want to throw like a should yeah. in the title there. Yeah. Should only do three things. That's right. Because what do we end up doing? We end up doing all the other stuff that doesn't get done after we've delegated it or isn't done in the way that we wanted it to be done, even though we didn't tell anybody else that, or something that somebody is trying to learn and we already know the answer to. So we have a to-do list. So the compromise that I strike with CEOs is this. The first three things that you do in the morning do something related to expanding the culture, and we'll talk about what that means. Do something related to expanding people or your organization's ability to attract and retain people, and do something around either the uh, agenda setting of numbers, the measurement of numbers, or the achievement of those numbers. And typically, I can get some buy-in on that. So we spend a couple of hours in the morning doing those things, then you're allowed to work on your uh, to-do list, which is probably a mile long the rest of the day. Then you're allowed. I like that. So yeah. we're talking about this word should, right? And this year, there's been a lot of scalebacks, obviously, with COVID. Now, you see it almost like two ends of the spectrum with businesses. Yeah. There's businesses like mine and yours that are just freaking thriving. We're growing. We're right. hiring. It's awesome. But then you see the other end of the spectrum to where there's people that have really, really had to pull back. So maybe yeah. the CEO in those scenarios is – saying, well, shoot, now I have to kind of dive into the day-to-day because the people I had literally that were taking care of those things are no longer here. They can't sure. be. How do, What would you say to them, you know, and what advice would you have to leaders, CEOs coming out of this? And notice I say that optimistically, coming out of the pandemic yeah. to where they can get back into their groove again with these three things. So the answer is the same to anybody, right? So if you're running a Fortune 100 company, and I've got some of those CEOs have read the book. Kevin Harrington wrote the foreword to the book. He runs massive organizations and, you know, before and that sort of thing. And he looks at it and he says, hey, this is just as applicable to me when I had three employees as when I had 3,000 employees. And the whole key is keeping everything in perspective. So a CEO is the only one in the organization that doesn't get the luxury of laying anything down for the day until they pick it up the next day. And you know that as well as anybody. We have to keep that stuff ahead of us, in front of us all the time, even if we've got a long to-do list. So those people that are in a, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of a regressive state right now because of the topsy-turvy nature of 2020, uh, it just gives them a little bit more uh, freedom, a little bit more focus, a little bit more discipline around, hey, these are three things that I know I can touch and control, even if I can't touch and control everything else, even if I've got to do a lot more day-to-day style, lower level work than I typically did in the past. And that should still come after those three things. So Absolutely. when you're allowed to do those day-to-day things, getting down into the trenches, that still should come after, even with the retractions. Absolutely. And that's the mental toughness attitude, right? Because the easiest thing in the world for me to do is to stumble out of bed, grab a coffee and get right into my inbox because I can answer emails from angry customers or I could forward this to somebody and create an action on their to-do list. And I feel like I'm doing something and I'm doing short-term work and short-term work has to be done. But if I don't build in as a discipline, 
the ability to do long-term work on a daily basis, it never happens. Most CEOs, you and I have talked about this, we talked about it in our group uh, not long ago, most CEOs uh, say, oh, I'm gonna do strategic planning, me and two of my team members are gonna go play golf for three days and come up with what we wanna do next year. And that's the only time they touch the long-term activity of the business is once a year. And, uh, and I think it should be a daily touch. So you're saying golf and alcohol should be a daily touch then? <laughs> Absolutely, should be the case. <laughs> yeah, right for sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're recording this on a Wednesday, and we do something around the office called WWW Wine and Whiskey Wednesday. But oh, everybody nice. brings their laptops in, at least on the leadership team, and, and we we literally get work done. You know, and that's yeah. a that's a weekly gig, at least when I'm in town. You know, and still, even when I'm not in town, they do it without me, which is pretty yeah. fantastic. So things keep rolling that way, and it's a it's a very genuine time that we have. So you know that that's company culture too, right? is attaching that kind of activity to that. And that's one of the things you're talking about that a CEO sh- should do, or the one of the three things that we should only do. Exactly. Even with the pandemic this year, you know, I could see, especially at the beginning, that company culture is something that took a huge hit a- across the board because of the uncertainty, the unknown, the fear. You know, for me, it was a different story because I chose to double down rather than pull back. So it was a much different, more forward-looking mindset. You know, and if, if you can give me a pat on the back for that, that's fine. But I just saw the opportunity. It's a different thing. But dude, people look to me all the time. My team looks to me for direction and positivity. And if I don't do that, I know I'm letting them down. But what did you see? You know, and what's a, how could culture be a competitive advantage even coming out of the pandemic? So the culture was the competitive advantage for everybody who got it right. Right. Those of us who have invested in the culture, you know, we were putting up stores for time when we needed to draw them down later. Nobody thinking that the pandemic was going to come in and the messaging around it was so fear based, (laughs) designed to steal joy, designed to steal confidence, designed to steal positivity, regardless of whether the virus is a real virus or not. And of course, we know, biologically speaking, it is the fear that was generated around it was paralyzing to a lot of people. And if your culture wasn't in tune to allow you to still make strides in as much as you could on any you know pending action, then then the outcome of uh, the impact on the virus on your business is linearly traceable to the quality of your culture. And so I have clients who, um, uh, frankly, hadn't gotten far enough down the road like you have, uh, and other businesses that we know have gotten far down the road. They didn't have that. And so, you know, the culture that emerged was much more of a least common denominator culture, like what can we get by with instead of, hey, we've we've locked arms before on something we believe in. We're going to continue to do that and we're going to thrive because of it. And you're right. You can see the bell end of both sides of that uh, of that spectrum of people that get culture right. Uh, and it becomes a competitive advantage against those who don't get it right or who haven't invested in it properly yet. It was intriguing, too, because numbers is one of those other three things, right? And even in the group that we were a, a part of, you know, there were some that I would hear to go down the route of saying, I'm going to pull back on everything. You know, and I'm even going to call my my landlord, you know, the of the office property that I'm renting, and I'm just going to ask for deferment or whatever, regardless, or just ask them to waive because it's tough and all these other things, you know, and they just immediately went into this almost like frenzy. You know, yeah. and it, it just blew my mind seeing that because even if you, they, the thing that really blew my mind is they didn't even know their numbers. They didn't even yeah. know if they needed the deferment or not. You know, and this was kind of across the board. They just went out asking for it anyways, just because they could get it as if it was like a handout or free money. And I'm thinking it's like, I'm an ethics guy. You know, that's yeah. the, that was the first red flag. But the second is that they didn't even know their numbers. They didn't even know where they were at. They didn't even know what their cash stores were. They didn't even know what the next six months looked like for them. And that's just something that blew my mind. How, explain this to me, because I've been looking at acquisitions too. And I yeah. have had to literally go through P&Ls for the owner, for the seller, and say when they say, well, we're, we're making 15 points of margin on, on these deals, I'm saying, dude, you're making like 0.15 points of margin. I'm looking at the P, your P&L right here. Well, that's not right. How can you not know your numbers as a CEO? You talk about a competitive advantage. That's one right there. You know, Knowing what your unit-based economics are, that I have to sell this thing for this amount of money in order to produce this profit that I can invest in the business, such base level 
knowledge most CEOs don't have. And for my consulting clients, we, we are tremendous uh, focused on transparency in the business. So every single employee that works for my company knows my p l in and out. They know what our profit margin is. We start that early when you come on board with us. I did one of the sessions with a new hire this morning who's been on board with me for four weeks. He couldn't believe I was telling him, this is my salary, right? He couldn't believe that I was saying, this is what to the penny we spend on marketing. And so what that means is it leaves us with a margin and that margin is why you have a job. You know, and that sort of thing, we, we talk through that. But CEOs of other businesses typically don't have that nailed. They don't know, to your point, they don't know their unit economics that way. And so the question becomes is how can you, how can you grow and how can you manage properly? How can you optimize um, against a, a set of numbers that you don't know? And the answer that you know already and your listeners know as well is you can't, you're faking it. And one of the things I hate the most is that fake it till you make it kind of thing, you know? I'd rather make it first. Let's just get to that point right off the bat. So we do a ton of education work with CEOs. And it, it's often the case that I close the, the door to the office, it's just the two of us. And it's like, hey, ask me the question you've been embarrassed to ask anybody when it comes to economics or, you know, or business math or something. And they always come out with something and uh, we can solve that for them. So that's awesome. Good. You know, I'm launching a mastermind in my industry, and that's one of the biggest downfalls I see because there's not many coaches in my industry. That, yeah. You know, there's there's a few small ones that are there, but not many larger ones. You know, masterminds almost don't even exist. You know, there's maybe wow. two out there, but the ones that I know of, I've actually been a part of, and mm-hmm. they don't teach the microeconomics that you need to know as a CEO. They don't even ed- educate the the business owner how to read those things. I mean, man, I learned, I th- I've told the story before, I learned how to read a P&L when I was 18 years old as a store manager at Radio Shack. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was the most important thing to me because I started realizing, it's like, my bonus is based off of this thing. I That's better exactly. know every single part of this so that I get paid as much as I possibly can. And you probably had to learn it on your own initiative and figure it out. Exactly, because almost all the other stuff, I was the, at that time, this was, you know, 99 or whatever, I was the youngest store manager that ever existed with Radio Shack at that point in time. I don't know what happened in the 20 years after, but that was it. I would look around and I'd ask for help for the other store managers and even from the district manager. I'm like, well, I don't know. We just give you access. I'm like, but, but we're all incentivized. At a management level based off of this thing. How can you yeah, not know? You can learn it in, in college and, you know, I, I don't think they teach it in high school very much, but you can learn it there. But until you're in the real world, and to your point, until you see those dollars on the page belonging in your pocket, you really don't care enough about it to make a, an ownership decision. And that's what we do is we believe and preach a, a philosophy called ownership thinking. And so we've got some great success stories. Uh, when 08 and 09 happened in our business, we were afraid. You know, we didn't know if uh, if the uh, you know elimination of business credit immediately meant that people couldn't buy our services anymore. And so I went to the team and I said, "Guys, you're very familiar with the P and L. You know the economics of the business. I want to get out ahead of things as as soon as I can. I need to find an extra two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of bottom line money." And how are we gonna do that? So we sat in the room the entire day and they said, hey, we need to eliminate this expense and Trey, you don't need to fly first class for the next 12 months. And you know, all of those kinds of things were on the table and we, and we made it happen. We got down to, we had about $80,000 left that we couldn't cut anywhere without damaging the functioning of the business. And so one of the receptionists, I had two receptionists at that point, one of the receptionists said, well, wait a minute, what if we just sold more, we would make more, We'd have to sell at least twice that because our margin's 50%. And this girl's 19 years old and she got it. And she got it because we were transparent. Then the other receptionist said, well, hey, my mother runs an HR consulting company. I bet she could use what we do. Ended up selling her exactly to the penny what we needed to make that $250,000 threshold. And it really did make the next two years a lot easier on us than our competitors. We ended up buying one of our competitors who didn't go through that exercise and we got a good price on it. We've you know, integrated them into our business now. So uh, I wouldn't have been able to do any of that if I wasn't transparent about numbers. That's awesome. So a 19 year old girl just said, hey, what if we sold more? Oh, yeah. be- because she knew the numbers. She knew exactly what would go to the bottom line. 
And Rick, it hadn't occurred to me yet when she. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic! That's oh my gosh! First team right there. Isn't sure. it so fantastic to surround yourself with just powerful people? I mean, intelligent people that are just bought in. Yeah, and the most exciting thing, and I know you you have the same passion that I do, is is finding somebody that really has no business at all being successful in what we do and nurturing and investing in them as people. And that's the third leg of the stool for us and really seeing the exponential growth that they bring to their own lives, which is satisfying as well, but then also to our businesses and our personal lives as well. It's amazing, man, because they start to develop skill sets that they never thought they had or, or even needed. Yeah, and yeah. then they start to apply that even to their personal lives. And even outside of work, the relationships get better because they're just more confident in themselves. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and I know because I've seen you do this and we've seen this in the rooms that we inhabit together sometimes. You know, the really great CEOs have a skill set, a, a dual skill set. They precept value in other people, right? It's almost like you've got a strange prescription contact lens. And when you look around the room and you say, this person over there is probably really good at something that they have no idea that they even have the ability to do it. And then we evoke that out. So preception and evocation. We evoke, it's from the Latin word voca, to call. We call out from that person uh, that ability that we see that they may not see. And if I, if I spend time with CEOs a long time over your wine and whiskey, I could ask you the same thing. Who did that for you? And you would have a story about it immediately, right? For me, it was my sixth grade uh, headmaster, Mrs. Brownlee. And she saw something in me, she called it out of me, I didn't see it in myself. And when I look at the guy in the mirror today, I see the guy that she saw back in 86, 88, 89, whenever that was. And it's amazing, great CEOs can do that. Man, that's amazing. <laughs> and doesn't that light you up too, when you see that? in other yeah. people to where you actually you see something in somebody and you just know it's not there yet but with a little guidance and just a little investment even in your own time that you'll start to see them just bloom into something that's incredible and then you get to that moment and it's not an i told you so moment it's a it's a time to where as a ceo you can share in that joy with them you can actually be lifted up in the same moment that they are that's what keeps me going man yeah i don't want to brag about a car or a house or a beachfront property or something like that. I want to brag about the people that uh, have self-actualized because of my belief in them before they had the belief in themselves. That's fantastic. So Wine and Whiskey Wednesday, right? You you got into, is it Tish Wines? Tish? Taiki Wines. Taiki yeah. so Wines. Taiki in uh, Greek mythology is the twin sister of Nike. Oh, so, is it really? <laughs> so Tyche is a, is a Greek goddess, and she's kind of the goddess of uh, causes that shouldn't be fought, <laughs> which is perfect for my wine endeavors. You know, I probably should be doing other things, but uh, my wife and I have a, uh, a passion uh, for the juice, man. And so we make our own wines and we do interesting things. That's awesome. I was looking at opening a wine bar a few years ago. I'm not a, you're a certified sommelier, which is fantastic. And uh, it's... Wow. Man, it's. I was going to open a wine bar. I'm not a sommelier, but I just enjoy the process. I enjoy the art form. I enjoy the pairings. I enjoy everything else. Give me, give me some that are readily available that are out there that are some of your favorites, kind of a go-to. We'll say like uh, around a hundred dollars a bottle. Yeah. So we're drinking a ton of uh, Mercury Head right now. I don't know if you've had that. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's delicious. We love it. We think it's a. Uh, you know, it's a hundred bucks a bottle, but we still think it's a good value for the quality of the structure of the juice that come out from that. My wife's a Camus head for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was sort of leading the question there a little bit, but <laughs> I figured that might pop up. <laughs> That's right. uh, she loves it. But then we drink our own stuff and, you know, we drink a ton of stuff that is, is not that impressive uh, to people. So people come to my house and they think, oh, he's a sommelier and there's wine you know, stacked everywhere and uh, he's going to pour some amazing thing for us and I'll end up pouring it and they'll say, gosh, this is just really good and drinkable and it'll be a 14 buck, you know, Sangio from uh, Tuscany or the, uh, the Siena Hills is a really fabulous appellation that we love and people can't, but they, they don't believe it. They think we're lying most of the time. Because it's $14. Yeah. <laughs> 14 bucks at Total Wine or wherever you get it, you know, but 
you, know, you don't have to drink the, the highest quality juice every single day to to have a good well, of course uh, you don't no i'm well. deep into scotch too you know and my, my go-to yeah. is and still one of my favorites to this day is macallan 12. Yeah. You know, it's it's around a sixty-five dollar bottle, and it's just it's fantastic for just a pour on any given day. Yeah. Have you had the uh, Glen Morangi Nectar Door? I sure have. Yeah, baby. <laughs> I go to, and it's not even scotch. You know, it's like scotch punch or something. <laughs> yeah, it's got so much citrus. It's in it. Way too smooth. Yeah, it does. And they age that in Sauterne barrels. So so turns the dessert wine from uh, from France, made mostly from the uh, Simeon grape. Uh, you know the really Chateau de Chem, really very very sugary sweet, syrupy sweet wine. Well, they age the scotch in that, and it yeah, they pulls do. That refinement out of it, and it's absolutely yep, it's a fantastic <laughs> kind of palish orange label on that guy. I've actually bought that for clients before as a gift too. One that uh, one that taught me years ago. I know we're diving into the the, the drink moment. We're getting away from the book here a little bit, but this is good. You know, this is the. the <laughs> So I'll tie it back to the book. Um, you know, one of the things that we do when we diagnose cultures is we see, do you do you have a culture? And we look not for uh, the engraving on the wall, right? Because even Enron had this great uh, corporate philosophy engraved in gold letters on the wall. That's not the proof of an existence of a culture. Ritualization is. And so if I poked my head in your office on a Wednesday and I saw people doing the same thing every single Wednesday, relating to each other and living the values, having those values show up in the behaviors of the people, that's great evidence of a great culture. That's fantastic. I, uh, I'm really excited for your book. And I'm, it's something that I'm going to pick up too. I want to get several copies actually for my, my upper team, if, the, if you don't mind. You know, and then no, we absolutely. can... We can give you feedback on that too, man. But it's, I think it's going to enrich our lives too. How did you, I, I know you, I'm interested in the wine, right? Because you look at other people out there like Gary V and you know, the guy has millions of followers. People see him as an influencer and that's great. I have a show that's in 30 plus countries around the world, you know, tens of thousands of followers here and there, but someone like Gary V has a real business. <laughs> <laughs> he started out as as a winemaker, which is what you're doing right now. But it was almost like inverse because you also have a real business. You're not just an author, right? You have a real business, but yet you're using that as a tool to get out there, just like the influencer space that I'm That's in. Right. You know, so how do you go from that, get, from having that business, you know, that w- which you do in coaching CEOs and bringing along C-level teams, regardless of that you just like wine <laughs> and that's yeah. your passion, what actually caused you to start a winery? Well, it's not a winery, but just a, a wine label. Yeah, so we, have a, we call it a virtual winery. So we buy juice uh, and the, there's a big dirty secret in the wine industry, which is overproduction. So every single winery in the world produces more juice than they can potentially use. So in France, they call it uh, the pour down, you know? So you pour it down until it ends up in table wine and it's mixed. You, you might have an ounce of the greatest wine from all of France mixed with some schlock that comes from, uh, you know, a different vineyard or something like that. But it, two buck chuck is exactly the same thing. It's just a tremendous blend of everything. And so early on in my wine interest phase, I met somebody and we invested in the, in the company and the company was called Crushpad, which foundered in 2008, which was a really, um, it was a really sad moment. So you know about um, uh, vanity wineries, right? So mm-hmm. if you call almost any winery, you can pay them enough money, they'll put your label. Your white label, yeah. Yep. Your juice. That's what I was looking at, opening the wine yeah. bar, yep. Yeah, so we didn't want that. What we wanted, and there's nothing wrong with it, but what we wanted to do was we wanted to have a say in the winemaking process. But, you know, I hate uh, fixed expenses, hate them, absolutely hate them in every business. So I didn't want to go buy land and then risk it all on a game of uh, do these grapes come out well or these don't or something like that. So what we ended up doing was buying juice and then we make the barreling decisions, we make the aging decisions, we make the blending decisions, uh, we make the bottle time decisions, all of that sort of thing to produce the wines uh, that we want. And so we've done a Howell Mountain Cab, we've done a Bordeaux, we've done a Sparkling from Sonoma Coast, we've done a Willamette Pinot, which was divine. Um, you know, we do all of those things and we get 300 to 600 bottles uh, from each each barrel or each wine uh, that we do. We give away most of it because it's largely a hobby. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into it. And uh, the backstory on really how I became a Psalm is 
um, I moved to my hometown, my family's hometown where I've never lived uh, in 2005. And I did that because we had lost my dad who was running our family business. And so I had to come home and sort of take over the business. And I was living in Atlanta and New Orleans and overseas and traveling a lot and that sort of thing. It was a real culture shock to move to rural Georgia. So I picked up a copy of the book called The Wine Bible and there was a new wine bar in town that opened up. I became friends with the owner and I would go and I'd say, this week we're gonna learn about Riesling. And he would get six or eight different Rieslings that I point out to him in the book. We would drink them and that sort of thing. And then I would go take the test. And so that's how I became uh, a psalm over time is to, is to sort of self-study. And it's the application of the uh, intellect to something that's also really fun uh, to do, which is to have a drink. And so that's the whole story there is how I became. <laughs> that's well. awesome. That's fantastic. How do you tie that back to the book? You know, what, what do your three things apply to the winemaking? <laughs> well, for us, we do a lot of cultural activity around that. So if Bingo. I'm actually, yeah, it, it's a lot of cultural stuff. But we also do um, sales related to that. So sometimes if I'm trying to get into a certain business opportunity and I'm beating my head on the wall, I'll call and say, hey, I do free wine tastings. Would you like me to host a custom wine tasting for your executive team? Walls come down immediately. We put great juice on the table. We put mediocre juice on the table. We teach a little bit. Ask me the question you always wanted to ask, but you didn't want to look stupid. We do all of that sort of thing. People enjoy it. And then potentially a business conversation can come out of it. And then it makes it fun for you too. It's fun. Even if I don't get the business, at least I had a good time drinking wine with some people. <laughs> probably. That's awesome, my man. I love it. Well, where can everyone find you? It, it looks like trinity-blue.com, right? Yeah, that's our consulting company, trinity-blue.com. And then, uh, you know, the book is released uh, November the 10th and yep. hits uh, Amazon on that day. So. Uh, would love for people to uh, pick that up and uh, leave us a review if you think it's good and uh, love to chat with anybody about that. My contact information's in the book and of course on the website. That's awesome. Go buy Trey's book and uh, let's make him a bestseller within the next 48 hours. Sound yeah. good? Yeah. yeah, excellent. <laughs> awesome, brother. Thanks, my man, for being on. Thanks, Rick. Uh, appreciate you and the work that you do as well. Thank you.